the plane landed safely at Frankfurt Airport in Germany. And Madison opened her eyes as if it was a new day. But she was the only one who knew that nothing had changed. Cliff walked out of the airport and put on a pair of sunglasses, which covered most of his face. Madison followed him, looking very dazed. She was surprised that Cliff was wearing sunglasses on a foggy day. Why do I keep feeling that Cliff looks familiar? She wondered. Cliff walked up to a nearby taxi and spoke to its driver. He then helped Madison into the back seat of the taxi. Madison didn't know where they were heading, and along the way she looked suspiciously at the man beside her from time to time, trying to work out why he looked so familiar. Without any warning, the cab was hit hard by another car as they drove along a city street. Madison was caught unprepared and was thrown back into her seat. She felt dizzy for a moment, but the driver reacted immediately and quickly regained control of the taxi. Cliff leaned forward to the driver. Lose them, he ordered. The driver nodded and looked at Cliff through the rearview mirror. He smiled and seemed eager to take on the challenge. Madison was still shaken from the impact, and her wound began to ache. The wound was only three days old and had hardly begun to heal. However, she didn't have any time to care about it at that moment. She held on tightly to the hand grip for support, and her eyes widened in fear as she looked at the other car that was racing with them along the busy street. The people in the other car stared into the taxi. Their eyes were filled with bloodlust and anger. Cliff, on the other hand, didn't show any emotion. Or at least he didn't seem to have any emotion. It was difficult for Madison to be sure because of his sunglasses. The taxi seemed to have been modified. Even though it had been hit hard by the other car, it was still intact. The taxi driver suddenly veered left, and the taxi merged onto the freeway where the two cars continued the chase at high speed. Madison saw that her car was about to hit another car in front of them, but the driver turned the steering wheel at the last moment and avoided it by inches. This happened several times, and Madison felt that her nerves couldn't take it. The car that was chasing them stayed close behind and wasn't deterred by the zigzagging of the taxi. Other cars moved out of the way to let them pass. Although Madison was scared, Cliff seemed very relaxed as though he were used to the situation, and he didn't seem to take it seriously. When the other car pulled alongside them again, Madison was shocked to see one of the passengers pull out a gun and point it at her. As she looked at the barrel of the gun, she felt her heart stop. The sound of a shot made her jolt. The cars on the freeway all braked hard. Many cars skidded because of the hard braking. Some of them couldn't stop in time and they hit the cars in front of them. In an instant, the freeway was in chaos. Wails, ear-piercing braking sounds, and people's terrified voices filled the air. Madison felt that she was seeing a slow-motion replay. If Cliff hadn't pulled her hard, she would have been hit by the bullet. Get down, he shouted as he pressed her head against his legs. At the same time, Madison saw him take out his gun from his waist. It was quite small but still looked deadly. The moment she saw it, she didn't doubt that Cliff was capable of using it effectively. Her eyes were wide open and she couldn't react at all. She was caught up in a gunfight and she had never encountered such a dramatic thing in her life. Even when she had been in Ian's car escaping the pursuit of the smuggler gang, she hadn't experienced the same level of danger. She kept her head down and trusted the skill of the two men who were with her in the taxi. Cliff aimed at the other car's occupants and pulled the trigger. The sound of the gunshot was so loud that Madison felt that she was about to go deaf. Because her body was curled up, she was in severe pain, but she didn't dare to move. After Cliff fired a couple of shots, the other car fell back, and the taxi soon left it behind as it drove off the freeway and through the German countryside, where there were only a few houses along the road. There were fields and clumps of trees, and for a short time the scene seemed peaceful. The peace was shattered when the other car appeared behind the taxi once more. It was heading toward them at high speed, and it seemed that its driver had the intention of ramming the taxi and forcing it off the road. Cliff turned around and looked at the people behind him. He held his gun with both hands and calmly shot. The car swerved a little and slowed down significantly. 
However, it soon recovered and caught up with them again. Because of the pain, Madison couldn't lie down any longer. She leaned against the car door and tried not to move after arranging her body as best she could to stay out of sight. Otherwise, she knew she would be a target, and Ian and her child would never see her again. The other driver seemed to have been provoked by Cliff's shot. He accelerated toward them as if he didn't want to live. The taxi slowed down a little, and the other car crashed into them again. Madison opened her eyes wide in fear as the door that she was leaning against opened slightly, and she felt a gust of cold wind on her body. She didn't have time to call out. As soon as she opened her eyes to see what was happening, she started to reach out of the taxi. She stretched out her hand in Cliff's direction and saw him reaching out to grab her. However, the two of them only touched the air for a moment before she fell. Stop the car, Cliff ordered. The driver seemed to be in a state of shock as he stepped hard on the brakes. With a squeal of brakes, the taxi skidded for a long distance. Before it had even stopped, Cliff jumped out and rushed toward the place where Madison had fallen out moments earlier. Fortunately for her, she was curled up, so she rolled away like a ball and hadn't gone under the wheels of the car. The driver of the car behind had sped off. Her small body had rolled onto the grass verge, and she had lost all feeling. Cliff looked at the unconscious woman. Madison, he shouted. After making sure that there was no danger around, he had put down his gun and reached out to pick her up. He saw that there was blood in her hair as well as on her cheeks. Madison, he shouted again as he stared at her intensely. Madison's face tensed up as she became semi-conscious. She felt dizzy and didn't know who was calling her. She tried to open her eyes and saw that there was no car chasing her, and there were no guns. She only saw Cliff looking down at her. Seeing that she was conscious again, Cliff felt relieved and started to smile. Perhaps it was because of the injury, or perhaps it was because she was frightened. But all Madison could do was look straight into Cliff's eyes. At that moment, a lot of images flashed through her mind, which had almost stopped working. With a trembling voice, she asked, who are you? Cliff's smile became slightly sinister as he pulled her into his arms and quietly said, My name is Cliff, but I'm also Hades. With one sentence, Madison's entire world seemed to collapse. Cliff was Hades. She had seen Hades before and hadn't expected that the face under the mask would be so handsome and young. He was only in his twenties, and he was already one of the world's most wanted criminals. She wanted to break free from his embrace, but before she could free herself, her head touched something, and it was so painful that she almost lost her breath. A smile also disappeared at that moment, and he looked at her nervously. He held her tightly in his arms and stood up. He could see that her head was injured and she needed treatment, so he decided to take her to his base without delay. In the spacious room, Madison lay quietly on the bed. The doctor and nurse were so busy that their feet hardly touched the ground. Near the window, Hades was holding a cigarette and sitting leisurely on a couch with his legs wide open. His evil eyes would occasionally sweep over Madison. Her pillow was covered in blood and looked alarming, but the medical practitioners weren't affected by it because they had seen injuries much worse than hers. After checking Madison thoroughly, the doctor, who was wearing a mask, walked up to Hades. How's she doing? Hades asked. She's had a significant head injury, but she'll recover. There's a possibility that she will lose her memory. But other than that, she should be okay, the doctor announced. As the doctor finished speaking, 
Katie's eyes started burning as he looked at Madison. Good. I want her to lose her memory. She shouldn't remember anything, he declared. The doctor was slightly surprised, but just nodded and turned around to return to Madison. The door was pushed open, and the sound of high heels sounded in the room as Sue walked in with her arms crossed. Her eyes only paused on Madison for a moment before shifting away. It was as if she were a stranger. Hades looked at her, but didn't greet her. Sue sat down opposite him and asked, Why did you bring her here? How can a woman who has been kicked out by the Weston family be of any use to you? Hades looked at Madison, who was still unconscious, and he smiled. Madison had many uses for him. He had borrowed her to get close to the Lynch family as well as the Weston family. Now, he wanted to use her to get close to Shane. Standing up, he flicked his cigarette onto the floor and watched the smoke rise. He looked down at Sue and said, You need to stay away from me after you finish your business. I don't like you, and I don't want to see you again. As he walked away, Sue turned around on the couch and looked at him. Don't worry. I'll be out of your hair soon. Thanks for your help. I appreciate it, she replied with a smile. Hades didn't say a word. He just left with a slightly gloomy face, and the room became silent except for the sound of surgical instruments being arranged. It wasn't the Mercy Hospital, nor was it the Weston family's territory, so it was quite easy for Hades to deal with Madison there. Sue stood up and looked straight at Madison, who was lying motionless on the bed with a pale face. As she looked at her, she wished that her daughter had never been born. Madison was dreaming vividly. In the dream, she saw a handsome man. His eyes attracted her so much that she couldn't move, and she stood where she was, waiting for him to come closer. She also saw a baby wrapped in blankets. In the blink of an eye, she saw another middle-aged woman in the family who didn't welcome her. There was also a woman with a big belly, as well as some other people she didn't know. Madison looked at the middle-aged woman and held her breath. She couldn't remember who she was, no matter how hard she tried. Her heart was roaring, and her entire body was boiling. But she felt completely helpless. She felt that there was someone who wanted to take everything away from her without her consent. No, she shouted. However, no one paid any attention to her. In a burst of intense pain... Madison struggled to wake up. Her entire body had been drenched by a cold sweat. She hugged her head tightly and sat up in a large bed. As her eyes wandered in the darkness, she silently sized up the situation in the room and tried to work out how she had ended up there. The room was very dark, and it was decorated simply. On hearing Madison moving, someone opened the door and walked in. It was a middle-aged woman who looked at Madison sitting up in the bed and immediately burst into tears. She rushed over and hugged Madison tightly in her arms as she cried, Madison, you finally woke up. I'm so happy. Madison was stunned as she looked at the woman in front of her, but she couldn't remember who she was. The woman gently held her and was careful not to touch her head, which was wrapped in thick bandages. Nor did she let herself touch the place where fluid was still flowing into her arm. Her eyes were full of love as she looked at her for a long time, but Madison still didn't recognize her. I'm so glad that you're awake. I was so worried about you, the woman cried. I think that your father must have been protecting you. Madison tried her best to make sense of what the woman was saying, but she couldn't remember anything. She opened her eyes widely and curiously looked at the woman who was holding her. She listened to her crying and laughing and tried to understand what she was saying as she spoke to herself, but she still couldn't find any trace of memory about her. After crying for a long time, the woman finally realized that Madison wasn't right. She wiped the tears away from her face and held Madison's thin, weak body as she said, "'Don't you remember me, Madison?' I'm your mother. We've been with each other for 23 years. You must remember me. No matter what the woman said, 
Madison didn't react at all. The woman saw that Madison didn't recognize her, and she started to cry again. She held her in her arms and asked, Why did you get into a car accident? The doctor told me that I might have lost my memory, but I didn't believe him. But now it seems that he is right, and you've forgotten about me. Madison frowned slightly and tried to remember where she had been before she had become unconscious, but she was unable to recall anything. The woman cried for a long time before she tried to calm her emotions. You are called Madison, and you're my daughter. Your father passed away when you were three years old, and I brought you up alone. A few days ago, you went out to work and got into a car accident, and you didn't wake up until today. Madison tried her best to absorb the information, but she didn't have any recollection of it. I'm your mother, so from now on, you don't need to be afraid because I'll protect you, the woman continued. As she spoke, she pulled Madison into her embrace. A week later, Madison got out of bed. She looked in a mirror and saw that the gauze had been removed from her head, and a deep mark was visible through her hair. She tidied her hair to cover the wound. She then walked around the room, examining everything inside it. It was the first time that she had begun to walk in her brand new world. From what the woman had said, she understood that her name was Madison, and she was 23 years old, and about to turn 24. She had suffered a car accident when she had gone to work a while earlier, which had caused her to lose her memory. Her father's surname was Greenwald, and he was no longer alive. As she became accustomed to her new environment, Madison remained cautious toward everything around her. It was as if she feared that she would encounter a setback if she were not vigilant enough. Even when facing her so-called mother, she felt the same. Gradually, she realized that her mother knew her very well. She knew that she loved to eat mango and that she liked dogs and drawing. All of this began the process whereby Madison slowly began to accept the woman and trust her. The mother acted like a person who cherished her. Every day, she did what she could to help her recover her strength. Even though Madison had been lying in bed for a long time due to her sickness, she didn't seem to be weak. As the days passed, the two of them quietly lived their lives together while Madison remained in isolation from the outside world. Every day when her mother went out to work, Madison would stay at home and watch over the house. She would feed the chickens and a pet rabbit, and she would even look after a big husky. According to her mother, the name of the dog was Joker. Whenever Joker saw Madison, he became very excited and would stay by her side. She would often sit with him at the front door of the house. The town was very small, and people often walked past the house. As they passed, some of the people would stare at Madison. Some townspeople greeted her. However, nobody approached her because Joker would bark at anyone who stopped. As they sat at the door of the house one snowy day, Joker placed his large head on Madison's lap and allowed her to stroke him as she pleased. Occasionally, he would let out a few sighs. Madison looked up at the darkening sky and became lost in thought. She had been there for a long time, but she still didn't have any sense of belonging. It was only when her mother was at home that she felt slightly less lost. She looked at the house behind her and frowned. Is this place home? I still don't have any memories of it. There's nothing about the place that seems familiar, she thought. She went inside and watched TV, which she often did to pass the time away. It was a way of helping her to recover her memories. She noticed that whenever she watched TV, she felt familiar with the clothing of many celebrities. She seemed to know what brand they were wearing. When she saw some commercials, she felt that they were so familiar that it was as if she had been involved in the production process before. On that particular day, she watched a travel show about Germany. As she saw images of one of the locations there, Madison's body suddenly tensed up. Madison wondered why she had shown a physical reaction on seeing the images of Germany. Have I ever been to Germany? 
I don't think so, but it seems familiar. Maybe I used to watch a lot of German movies before the accident, she thought, as she tried her best to search for a reason for the spark of recognition that had been lit in her memory. I should ask my mother if I have any connection with Germany, she thought. Madison remained in deep thought as she struggled to follow the lead that the image on the screen had given her. Although she had lost her memory, she had the sense that Germany was very significant. She didn't know what it was, but the feeling of it was quite uncomfortable. She wanted to uncover her memories, however painful. No matter what had happened, it was her life, and she needed to know about it. I have the feeling that my life before the accident wasn't as dull as it is now. I have a vague impression of danger and excitement, and this small town offers neither of those things, she thought. Just as Madison's mind was struggling to make a connection, a white SUV stopped in front of her house. Madison went to the window and watched as the car door opened, and a pair of long legs appeared. There was a crunching sound as the person stepped out onto the snow. She then saw a man with a friendly smile standing by the car and looking at her. His long, dark blue overcoat was wrapped tightly around him to protect him from the chilly wind. When Joker joined Madison at the window and saw the man walking up the pathway, he unusually dropped his fierce look and slightly tilted his head before going back to lie down in front of the fireplace, where he curled up into a ball. His big eyes continued to stare at Madison. Shane walked up to the window and said, Madison. Madison looked at the man and was completely dumbfounded. She didn't know who he was, but she instinctively turned to go to the front door. Who is this guy? He seems to know me, and Joker doesn't seem to mind him being here, so maybe he's been here before. If he were dangerous, Joker would bark at him, she thought. She glanced at the large dog before leaving the living room. Usually, he scared people when they so much as dared to stop for a moment on the sidewalk outside their house. Now he was happily dozing in front of the fire as if he knew that the man wouldn't hurt her. Madison's brows were tightly knitted as she opened the door and leaned out to look at the man. As he walked from the window to the open door, his smile became gentler and more loving. Madison looked at him and she tried to relax, hoping that by being at ease she would allow any dormant memories of him to awaken. When he reached the door, he looked down at her and said, It's so good to see you again. His voice was so warm that it seemed like it would melt the snow that lay around the house. I'm Mr. Crawford. Jane, do you remember me? Madison didn't have any reaction to his name although she had a feeling that it was significant in some way. Shane didn't know how to describe his feelings as he watched her struggle to remember him. In the end, he couldn't maintain his restrained attitude, and he hugged her tightly. The strength of his hug continued to increase, as if he needed to hold her so tightly to stop her from disappearing. Madison, come with me. I'll take you home, he offered. Before she could reply, her mother appeared. When he saw her, Shane raised his eyebrows slightly but didn't say anything. The mother was also slightly surprised when she saw Shane. She knew who he was and that Madison had always trusted him. Madison, my sister is sick and I need to go and take care of her for a while, she announced. Fortunately, you're better now and don't need me to look after you anymore. Now that Mr. Crawford is here, you can go and stay with him. I'll be back soon, so don't worry. Madison was surprised that she was letting her go with a stranger so easily. The mother then walked away from them and got into her car. Before closing the door, she waved at Madison and blew her a kiss. Her swift disappearance made Madison frown slightly. Is she my mother? She asked. Shane looked at her with some surprise. After losing her memory, she had become very different in some ways. The former Madison had been so kind that it had sometimes made people feel irritated with her. She had been kind to anyone without any care about her situation. She hadn't even been wary of those who were unkind to her, and she had rarely doubted others. However, as far as he knew, 
The first person that Madison had encountered after losing her memory was the woman who had just left, and Madison seemed to be suspicious of her. Because of her question, Shane could see the changes in Madison. After losing her memory, she seemed to have grown up. Shane didn't answer her question. Instead, he asked, What do you think? Madison narrowed her eyes slightly, but didn't say anything. Shane was encouraged by her increased maturity. Although he wanted to take her back, he had been worried that her openness would mean that she would be put into danger again. He knew that she needed a lot of protection, but her increased wariness would allow him to rest more easily. After being taken away by Shane, Madison didn't see the so-called mother again. Shane took her to a small apartment where she lived alone under his supervision. After Madison had left the city, he had used the Crawford family's contacts as well as Interpol to search for her. Ian had also secretly used all his resources to search for her in Germany. However, Shane had been more successful than Ian because he was more highly trained at searching for people. Even with his superior skills and resources, it had still taken him several months to discover Madison's location. After quietly staying in the apartment for two days, Shane told her about her expertise and even helped her in finding a job. He wanted her to be independent and strong. At the same time, he held back from telling her all the details of her background, fearing that it would be too much for her to bear until she was stronger. He also feared for her safety. The people in the city had been fascinated by Madison's disappearance for a while, but the news of it was replaced by the revelation that Diana had died. Diana's sudden death shocked the city. Edward and Olivia had quickly taken her place at the head of the family. Daniel had also begun to take charge of the Weston group. Even Cassandra took on more responsibility. Ian, however, kept a low profile. Diana's death was declared to be a murder. When that news spread, everyone was shocked, and Olivia and Edward tried to suppress any rumors about her death. Daniel was put in charge of the Weston group's day-to-day -day activities, and it was rumored that he had a secret girlfriend who was pregnant with his child. People felt sorry that Diana wasn't going to be able to enjoy having another great-grandchild. Although Diana seemed to have been murdered, her killer was still at large, and the police couldn't find any trace of him or her. When the police concluded that Diana had been murdered, many people in the city went into a state of panic. No one knew what the motivation for the killing had been. Nothing seemed to have been taken from her room. The people of the city patiently waited for more news. They all wanted to know when and where her killer would be discovered. After Diana's death, Olivia held all the power in the family. She and Edward were kept very busy dealing with the fallout of recent events. Daniel and Cassandra were also kept busy. Only Ian seemed very relaxed. If it hadn't been for the fact that he was looking after Sophia, he might have been pulled up by Daniel and given a good dressing down for being so uncaring. Ian didn't care about the wild rumors that were flying around. He was more concerned with Madison and was constantly on the phone with Francis and Paul. They were finding the intensity of their work unbearable, but neither of them dared to even ask for a short break. As well as Madison being missing, Diana's murderer hadn't been found, and they didn't have any idea what had happened to the old lady. Added to that, Ellie had also disappeared without a trace. While Ian was quietly paying close attention to the Weston Group share price, the comments on the online forums got nastier. I heard that Diana once loved her grandson, Ian. It now looks like her love wasn't reciprocated. That's right. He didn't show any reaction to Diana's death. Even Daniel is working hard at the Weston Group every day. Olivia is also doing a great job looking after the family. Diana's idol grandson, Ian, on the other hand, isn't doing anything to help. No wonder Madison left him. Who would want to be with such a waster? He doesn't even have a conscience. While the discussions on the outside were getting uglier and more intense, 
Some of the people who were eyeing the Weston group extended their claws, wanting to profit from the family's troubles. When they saw that Ian was backing away from the family, they mustered up all their courage and started thinking about making a move on the stock market. During the next shareholders' meeting, someone suggested to Daniel that he should reallocate the Weston group's power. When he heard their suggestion, he laughed in front of them. I thought that you guys would be able to keep your composure. I never thought you'd get spooked so easily. Daniel quipped to the shareholders who had questioned him. He crossed his arms and looked at them dismissively as he leaned back in his chair. I never thought that you guys would listen to the uninformed opinions of the general public. He added, What a bunch of idiots you are. He didn't hesitate to insult them, and he got up and left the meeting without showing any emotion not to indicate that he was taking them seriously. The shareholders were furious. When they found out that Ian was still indifferent, they decided to order someone to make a move. Since Daniel hadn't believed that they could act on the stock market, they would prove him wrong. The next day, the Weston family, which had suffered from many disasters in the previous few weeks, suffered another heavy blow. The value of their company's stock fell dramatically, and almost two-thirds of the value of the Weston Group was wiped out in an instant. Even so, the Weston family still didn't react. The other shareholders became very angry at their lack of action and started to threaten the Westons. Later that day, Daniel and Cassandra were present at a huge banquet. The moment they arrived, they stunned everyone with their apparent indifference to their company's troubles. Daniel nonchalantly sipped a glass of champagne while a group of disgruntled shareholders gathered around the couple. Why are you looking so pleased with yourself? complained one of them. Without Diana, your family is falling apart. Several other shareholders then joined in. You're just a bunch of immature brats trying to control the Western group but failing spectacularly. It's okay for you guys because you probably have lots of other assets. I'm not so lucky because all my money is invested in the Weston Group, so I stand to lose everything. I'm surprised that Olivia hasn't stepped in by now. I used to think she would be a safe pair of hands, but now I can see that Diana was the only one of you with any sense. Daniel and Cassandra listened to them without even trying to defend themselves. They gave the impression of being unconcerned by the criticisms. A major shareholder approached Cassandra, and looked her up and down with his muddy eyes. Cassandra, if you're willing to spend some time with me, I'd be happy to overlook my grievances against your family. How about we get out of here? He whispered. As he spoke, his wine glass was about to touch Cassandra's bare arm. Then without any warning, a shrill cry was heard, and his hand was violently twisted. Let go of me! Don't you know who I am? The man shouted. He turned around to look at his assailant, expecting that it would be a member of the Weston family. He was surprised to see Shane looking at him with a menacing expression. His face was so shocked that the shareholder immediately shut his mouth and didn't say another word. Cassandra viewed the shareholder's humiliation with a feeling of deep satisfaction. She raised her glass to Shane and drained the champagne from it. As long as Shane was around, no matter what kind of relationship they had, she would never be bullied. Shane twisted the man's hand further and then flung him away. He then gazed intensely at Cassandra. It was the first time she had felt Shane gaze at her in that way, and it made her blush. The surrounding shareholders restrained themselves because of Shane's appearance. Soon after, there was a small commotion from behind the crowd as people made way for a man who was walking purposely through the banquet hall. Everyone looked straight at him as he passed through. Ian was wearing a black suit. However, what people noticed most was that he was carrying a sleeping baby in his arms. It seemed quite incongruent. Ian frowned as he approached Daniel. He stood in front of him and impatiently looked at the troublemakers, who stepped away, but were still close to his brother. He noticed that Cassandra seemed to be in an exceptionally good mood. She went up to Ian and took Sophia from his arms. Because there were so many people there, she woke up, blinking and looking around at everyone. 
Ian looked sharply at the shareholders who were causing trouble. He was in no mood for their complaints. No matter how many people he had sent to look for Madison, they hadn't been able to find her, and it was driving him crazy. Diana's death had already depressed his spirits. Even though Diana had opposed him and Madison, he knew that her love for him had been genuine. He took a glass of champagne from a passing waiter and gulped it down. He looked cool, but he wasn't in a good mood. I'm looking forward to seeing your expressions a few seconds from now, he said to the shareholders. Before they could react to his words, they heard their phones ringing. They each answered the call, and they were devastated by what they had heard. Some of them couldn't even hold onto their phones, and they dropped them onto the floor. The man who had just been taught a lesson by Shane collapsed. The shareholders had all tried to profit from the volatility of the Weston Group shares. When they had seen that the share price was particularly low, they used all their assets to go long on the Weston Group. However, the price had moved against them, and they had all received margin calls, forcing them to sell most of their shares to prevent them from being liquidated. The Weston family had been taking advantage of the opportunity to buy their shares at a bargain price and had immediately seen a big profit. You crooks have trussed us up like turkeys, one of the shareholders shouted at Ian. Ian said coolly, You guys made the wrong call. It's nothing to do with us. None of them believed him. Ian had warned them that they were about to receive a shock, so they expected that he had manipulated the market in some way. You won't get away with this, one of them shouted at Ian. Go tell it to the SEC, see if I care, Ian said dismissively. He was completely confident that he had covered his tracks. He didn't feel the slightest bit guilty about what he had done, because he knew that the shareholders had been trying to flee his family. The news of the Weston's change of fortune spread like a gust of wind. Many people were jealous that the Westons had made such a killing, Others saw it as a reminder that they should never challenge the powerful Weston family. In the course of the evening, the Westons regained their position as the preeminent force in the city. Daniel looked proudly at the angry shareholders and said disdainfully, As the Chinese say, a lean camel is bigger than a horse. Even though we suffered a setback, our resources remained huge, and you guys were no match for us. Learn from your mistakes and don't try to get the better of us again. One of the shareholders who couldn't figure out what had happened went crazy and tried to snatch Sophia from Cassandra. However, before he could touch the child, Ian stood up and grabbed the man's collar. Ian's expression was so frightening that the man froze. I I'm sorry, I, I don't know what came over me, the man stammered. Get out of here. And don't let me see you ever again, Ian snarled, pushing the man away. He stumbled and fell to the floor, then quickly recovered and headed toward the exit without looking back. Seeing how Ian had dealt with the man, the other shareholders all took a step back, not daring to offend the powerful and unpredictable Weston. The news about how Ian had protected his daughter spread like wildfire. Someone tried to use Ian's daughter to threaten him, but got humiliated. What an idiot. Didn't that guy realize that the Westons are untouchable? Ian didn't hit the guy, but the look on his face made the man pee himself. Ian picked up Sophia, who was unaware of the drama that had been playing around her. She only saw Ian's gentle smile. His persona had changed from a few moments earlier, and he looked like a different person. It had been a big evening for the Weston family. Their power and influence had been consolidated, and their little princess was mentioned by many people. There had been a lot of stories about her, but very few people had seen the cute little girl. Late at night, in Ellie's room at the Thompson's house, the flames in the fireplace lit up her face making it look especially terrifying. She was slowly burning a pile of papers and thinking about Diana, who had been declared murdered. Ellie's body was trembling as she knelt in front of the fire, and she softly muttered, Grandma, don't blame me. This wasn't my fault. I didn't do it on purpose. You must believe me. 
I love you. She continued to burn the documents. Every time she pulled out a sheet of paper from the stack, she would feel her body trembling. Each sheet held details of her evil deeds. They told how she had traveled abroad and caused someone's death, and how she had misled reporters to protect her relationship with the Weston family. There was also information on her to plot to harm her sister, causing Claire to lose both her legs. Or damning still, there was evidence of how she had sold her parents to Jaguar so that their organs could be harvested. The thick folder's contents were explosive. Ellie believed that if Sue hadn't handed the documents to Diana, the old lady wouldn't have known that she had committed so many crimes, every one of which was enough to send her to prison. When Ellie read about her parents' organs being removed and sold, she felt panicked for the first time. Grandma, she softly called out, seemingly in a daze. It was as if she expected that Diana would appear next to her. Grandma, don't blame me. I didn't do it on purpose. A gust of wind blew past the window. It carried large flakes of snow and made a dull sound that scared Ellie and made her shiver. And she started to burn the documents more quickly. Her eyes were burning as she looked at the fire, and her thoughts drifted to the day that her wedding was due. Sue had given Diana the documents, and Ellie had been thinking about what to do about it. She had been caught unprepared by the series of events, Diana had called her over to the Weston's mansion, and Ellie remembered that she had had a bad premonition about it. Almost everyone in the Weston mansion was gone. When Ellie went in alone, she saw someone repairing the surveillance cameras. But apart from that, the place was empty. Edward had gone to the hospital to see Madison's child and to take care of Ian, who was sick. There was only Diana left in the house, so Ellie walked in unimpeded. Diana's bedroom was very dark, and the old lady was sitting by the window. Only a dim light shone on her body, making her look like a ghost. Ellie stood there blankly, not knowing what to say or do. Grandma, she called out. She tried her best to hold back her tears and ran toward Diana. I've become a joke in this city. Ian doesn't want me... And even my parents have run away from me. You're all I have left now, she whined. In the past, Diana would have reached out and stroked Ellie's hair to comfort her. However, the old lady didn't react to her tears. Although Ellie looked up at her with pleading eyes, Diana seemed unmoved, and her expression was cold and hard. The hand that was holding her walking stick was shaking violently, and Ellie looked straight at it. She then noticed that there was a half-drunk cup of tea on a small coffee table, and next to it was a thick folder. Grandma! Ellie cried even more sadly. She held the old lady's hand and said, I have nothing now. Diana only looked at her firmly, and after a long silence she said, Tell me, where are your father and mother now? What happened in your house that day? Ellie felt panic wash over her and she let go of Diana's hand. Her frightened look was like an admission of guilt. Diana looked at her with disappointment. She waited for Ellie to speak, but the young woman had nothing to say in her defense. After a long silence, Diana banged her walking stick on the floor. Ellie, I never knew that Jared and Brooklyn died long ago and were killed by their daughter. In what way did they mistreat you so that you would do such a cruel thing to them? As she spoke, Diana raised her voice a little, and Ellie was so frightened by the sudden change that she fell to the floor and wept. Standing up, Diana picked up the folder and took out some sheets from it. She read them in turn and threw each one at Ellie when she was finished. You contacted Hades when you were 18 years old. Getting involved with someone like that was a stupid thing to do. Then, so that you could get a new heart... You even plotted to kill Lynn Morris. The Morris family was destroyed by what you did. You also put on a show to boost your reputation in my family. Your scheming knows no limits. Look at this. It says that you gave children and beggars to Hades and even used him to kill your parents. Ellie, do you have any conscience? 
Ellie remained on the floor sobbing. Several pieces of paper containing the damning evidence against her lay over her body. I can't believe I was taken in by you. I fought with the rest of the family over you. Now I see that my judgment was deeply flawed. Diana continued. As she became more enraged, she threw more of the sheets at Ellie. Shaking her walking stick, she looked down at Ellie and shouted, You treated me as your chess piece. You have no shame and no respect for me. Ellie crawled up to Diana and grabbed her skirt. Grandma, it wasn't me. I didn't do any of this. I'm the girl you watched growing up. How could I do such a thing? You know that I'm not like that and that I would never deceive you. She wailed. Diana looked in disappointment at Ellie, who was kneeling at her feet. It's because I've watched you grow up that I find it so hard to accept. The thought that the kind and beautiful Ellie from those days was so vicious makes me feel very sad. You even dare to lay your hands on your parents, and that scares me. Is there anything you wouldn't dare to do? She asked. Grandma, believe me, it wasn't me. Ellie persisted. She then cried until she was out of breath. Ellie was unwilling to admit any of the accusations. The matter had already been decided in Diana's mind as a fact. She had received information from two sources. Even if Sue's documents were fake, the housekeeper's findings were equally damning. Ellie didn't know about the housekeeper's investigation, and she said, I didn't do any of this. You know that I love small animals. I cherish life. So how could I do such a thing? This information is all lies. Shut up, Diana shouted as she banged her stick down hard onto the floor. I was fooled by your superficial skills. That's why I thought you should marry into my family as Ian's wife. I didn't even mind that you couldn't give birth to children. I thought that it would be enough to find a surrogate mother for Ian to have a child in the future. I didn't realize that I had invited a wolf into my house. Did you plan to kill me too, once I'd served my purpose? Ellie was so shocked that she fell at Diana's feet. I would never want to harm you or anyone, she bawled. The anger in Diana's heart exploded. She was filled with pain and disappointment, and she couldn't hide her disgust toward Ellie. She had controlled the entire Weston family, but after so many years, she had fallen victim to a young woman who she has seen as a sweet and innocent child. She had misjudged Ellie, believing her to be a different person, and had even protected her over her children and grandchildren. She had been humiliated by the person she had trusted. Why did you do it? What did I ever do to you? Diana demanded. Why would you do this to my family? Diana couldn't figure it out. She couldn't think of any reasons why Ellie would want to cause chaos in her family. She continued, Before you came back, I thought that Madison would stay with Ian forever. Even though her family background wasn't great, I'd accepted it. At least she was good to him. Because you liked Ian, I did everything I could to enable you to marry him. But you've slapped me in the face. 